Today's presentation is part of our all-new Safer Foods Toolkit and Resource Center, brought to you in part by Clover Organic Farms and Sage Spoonfuls. This presentation will be recorded and available by tomorrow in our Resource Center, along with our interactive ebook, downloadable brochure, and infographic. You can access the Resource Center at healthychild.org slash resource dash center. Now let's get started. For most of human history, people have eaten relatively simple diets. For our ancestors, food came from whatever they could catch, kill, pick, or grow, from nature. Today the picture is much more complicated. Ingredients are increasingly modified, manipulated, and processed in factories and laboratories. Artificial additives, sweeteners, and preservatives make up much of the foods available on the grocery shelves. And companies continue to wooze with savvy, savvy marketing terms and fail to be transparent about what's in their products. They say you are what you eat, but what are you really eating? More importantly, what are our children eating? Consider these facts. Currently, 80% of all antibiotics sold in the U.S. go to farm animals, the same animals whose milk we drink and meat we ingest. According to the EPA, nearly 900 million pounds of pesticides are applied to the farms that produce the fruits and vegetables we eat every year. In fact, studies show that a child consumes more than five servings of pesticides every day from food and water. And genetically modified ingredients are found in 70% of all processed foods. The truth is, we really don't know what we are eating. But as parents and advocates for healthier foods, we can seek solutions and make simple, healthier changes to our family's diet that can make a huge difference. Case in point, a study produced in 2008 by Environmental Health Perspectives found that after just five days of eating organic produce, there was virtually no trace of pesticides in children's bodies. Little changes do have an impact. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker this afternoon who's going to talk about some of these simple steps parents can take to develop healthier, safer eating habits for the whole family. Dr. Alan Green is a pediatrician and father of four. He is the founder of drgreen.com, cited by the American Medical Association as the pioneer physician website, author of Feeding Baby Green, Raising Baby Green, and From First Kicks to First Steps. And he is the deputy editor of the Journal of Participatory Medicine. Dr. Green is the founding president of the board of the Society for Participatory Medicine and serves on the board of Healthy Child, Healthy World and the Lunchbox. Project. In 2010, Dr. Green founded the White Out Now movement to change how babies are fed, starting with their first bite of solid food. He appears frequently in the media, including The Today Show, The Dr. Ross Show, Good Morning America, Fox and Friends, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Time Magazine, Parade, Glamour, and Parenting. Uh, Dr. Green, thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll let you take the floor. Thank you. Great being with you today. Uh, you're going to be hearing, let me see if I can get the slides to advance here a bit. One, two, three. There we go. Oh. There we go. The first thing I want, you're going to be hearing today about how the alarming rise of food allergies in kids and chronic illnesses and some of the horrible stuff in our foods. But I want to start today by encouraging you, teaching you about something called nutritional intelligence. Nutritional intelligence is the simple ability to recognize and enjoy healthy amounts of good food. And most kids today do not have nutritional intelligence in the United States. And this is important because we've crossed a, uh, an important line. Most kids in the United States today will have a chronic illness in childhood. And that chronic illness will be food-related. It's really important that kids learn how to enjoy great food. And I want to inspire and encourage you today that it's possible and not that hard for kids to learn to enjoy good food. So later when you hear about the food allergies and terrible ingredients, think back. We've learned something in the 21st century that's so important. Food preferences are learned. A lot of folks think it's genetic that certain kids are – uh, are born not liking broccoli or not liking peas or not liking vegetables. A lot of people think that it's inevitable, it's impossible to teach kids to learn to like great food, but we learn food much the way that we learn a language. And if we start immersing kids in delicious food, they will start to enjoy it. So one of the studies that first convinced me of this was a study done a number of years ago, a couple of decades ago now, uh, with cats. 
that if cats are true carnivores in nature, they are built to live with no plant foods at all in their diet. And in this particular study, uh, what they did is they, they know that cats don't like fruits. And in particular, most cats, uh, of all the foods that were studied, the least favorite food for cats was bananas. So what they did is they tried to teach cats to eat this food that wasn't good for them, bananas. And the way they did that, and I'm not recommending this, and, I, I, and I'm not even supporting the study, but we can learn from it, is they put electrodes in the brains of some adult cats and, uh, and gave them this surge of pleasure whenever they would approach bananas. And very quickly, the, these cats would walk past all the typical cat foods, meats and birds and, and fish and milk, and would go straight for the bananas. And I'm not saying that's the way to teach kids. But the thing that was so striking about that was these cats were mother cats, and their kittens were observing. And they were drinking milk from their mom that was flavored a little bit with bananas. And when it came time for these little baby kittens to be weaned without electrodes, these baby kittens would walk right past the meat and the fish and the milk, and these baby kittens became banana-eating cats. And even when mom was out of the picture, they, they would prefer bananas to other foods. Food preferences are learned. They're deeply learned. And, of course, the question is, is this, is this true in humans? And we know from research that it is. And you, we also know from just looking around this, is it possible to teach humans to eat food that their bodies don't really crave? And that's what's happened all across the U.S. today. So, the other important concept to learn in people is there's something called food neophobia, and that is a physical fear of new fruits and vegetables. This starts once kids start learning how to walk. It peaks at about age three. It continues all the way up until puberty at least. And, and it is, it's a physical fear when kids are exposed to new flavors, new colors, new textures, new sources of food. And it makes sense. You wouldn't want kids to walk out into a garden, into a, a meadow or a forest and pick a leaf of all the green things out there. It might not be a vegetable. It might be something toxic. Or to pick a berry and eat it. It, it might not be a delicious fruit. It might be poisonous. So they're designed not to like new fruits and vegetables once neophobia sets in. So the goal is, before neophobia starts, if possible, to expose kids to as many healthy fruits and vegetables and real flavors as possible, spices, to, to get them to fall in love with it very early on. It's possible at any age, but before neophobia starts is the best time to do it. Sadly, in the U.S., the main thing that most kids have eaten for the last number of decades before neophobia starts is processed jarred food and processed white, white, white flour cereal, predisposing them to like all the kids' meals and junk foods that are out there. So I just want to give you a couple of tools today to help flip the switch where they, where they recognize food as good. And to understand just a little bit how this works, things that are sweet, things that are salty, things that have fat, automatically taste good. But anything that has a bitter note in it, uh, like most vegetables do, or anything that has a sour note in it, like many fruits do, uh, they're predisposed not to like at first. They have to get exposed to it the, a number of times in, a, in this critical window to recognize, yes, this one is safe. A, a switch flips inside and they think, yes, this is really good to eat. So how do we make that happen? Three tools I want to give you today. One of them is repetition. We know with babies, if they're between a time they're sitting up and the time they learn to walk, if, if you ask parents what their least favorite food is, and the most common response to that is peas, then you ask them to give just one bite a day for a week of peas. You don't have to push it. You don't try to force them to eat any more than they want. At the end of just a week, most kids will love peas. So before neophobia sets in, repetition, repetition, repetition can help kids fall in love with great flavors. Even after neophobia sets in, it works, but it takes a lot more time. It takes not a week, but months before they learn to like something. But the months are an investment worth doing because this is a flavor they can start really loving for a lifetime. Two other tools I want to give you really quickly. And the book Feeding Baby Green is not all the things that flip that switch in people and help them love good food. The next one I want to give you today is uh, when a respected hero likes something, kids are more likely to like it. Adults, too. 
we know that when the President of the United States said they didn't like broccoli, broccoli sales fell. When they said they did like pork rinds, pork, pork rind sales shot through the roof. Throughout history, when a respected hero likes something, people are more likely to believe it to be safe and tasty as well. There was a study done in kids where uh, they offered them a choice of broccoli or chocolate, and not surprisingly, all the kids picked chocolate. But then they did it again with Elmo stickers, and half of the kids picked up broccoli just because there was an Elmo sticker on there. So early on, the best respected hero is mom. And if it's in breast milk, if it's in mom's diet before the baby's born, and amniotic fluid, and they're just tasting that, they can fall in love with it. As they get older, characters and slightly older peers can be great heroes to help kids learn to like foods. The other tool I want to get you for older kids is when they learn, uh, when, when they're afraid of food, if they're involved in the food prep with their parents, they can learn to like a food they never liked before. Most kids in the U.S., do not like tomatoes. They never got exposed to that texture and flavor together before neophobia. But if a child is handed a knife carefully and helps slice the tomato, then they are about twice as likely to like the tomato. Still not most kids. If they pick a tomato and help to and then slice it, they're about twice as likely again. Still not most kids. But if they're involved way upstream and plant a tomato, watch it grow, and then pick it and eat it, most children will like tomatoes. So the more you can get kids involved in growing any kind of food, involved in cooking classes and involved with you in the kitchen, the more you can teach them to love great stuff. And this is critically important because great food is, is the core to great health for children and sending them on a trajectory for a lifetime of health. I'm happy to answer any questions later today in the webinar or afterwards. And feel free to connect on Facebook or Twitter or wherever. Thank you, Dr. Green. Really appreciate that. That was wonderful. Um, our second speaker today is Robin O'Brien. Robin is the author of The Unhealthy Truth, How Our Food is Making Us Sick and What We Can Do About It. A former food industry analyst and mother of four, Robin brings insight, compassion, and detailed analysis to her research into the impact that the global food system is having on the health of our children. She founded the Allergy Kids Foundation and was named by Forbes as one of 20 inspiring women to follow on Twitter. The New York Times has passionately described her as Foods Aaron Brockovich, and her work has been critically acclaimed by Dr. Oz, Dr. Bob Sears, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Aaron Brockovich, Yoko Ono, and others. Robin's work has also been seen in Food Inc., filmmaker Robert Kenner's 2012 documentary, Labels Matter, and with Jamie Oliver's Food Revolution. Very impressive, Robin. Thank you for being a part of today's webinar. I'll let you begin. Well, thanks so much, you guys, for being part of today's conference. I recognize how busy it is during the summertime as a mother of four and the juggling act and how you can be thrown a curveball at absolutely any time. So I really appreciate the time everyone is spending with us today. As Dr. Green and Andrea have highlighted, um, the landscape of children's health has changed and the landscape of food has changed so dramatically in the last 15 years. And I think as mothers and as parents, we suddenly find ourselves dealing with something that really none of us were prepared to deal with. You know, we thought we would be inheriting these rules and these recipe books and the ways that our mothers and our grandmothers were able to, to raise their children. And what we're quickly realizing is that in the face of these escalating rates of conditions and diseases and everything from allergies to ADHD to diabetes to even pediatric cancer, I mean, there are so many conditions impacting kids that sometimes it's just overwhelming and you want to shut down. But I think as a mother and as a parent, we all know that that, that paralysis just simply is not an option. And as we begin to navigate this changing landscape, um, to lean on each other and to use these resources is just an incredible opportunity because it has changed so much. Um, today, you know, the statistics I'm going to share, I mean, they can absolutely just rip your heart out. Um, and what we need to do as parents and what I firmly believe our legacy is as parents to do is to restore the health of the children. Because while they're only 30% of the population, they're 100% of the future of this country. And right now, if you look at the health of today's children, it is, it is an enormous opportunity to engage and become part of that change. One in three kids has allergies, autism, ADHD, or asthma. 
cancer is the leading cause of death by disease in children under the age of 18. We have escalating rates of diabetes. One in three Caucasian kids and one in two minority kids are expected to be insulin, insulin dependent by the time they reach adulthood. These are jaw-dropping statistics, and it really can make you want to shut down. But as anyone on this call understands, that simply is not an option. We have this responsibility to, to the health of our children. And thankfully, today, with the internet and with resources and technology, with doctors like Dr. Green that are leading the charge, we can start to, to create the changes that we want to see in the health of our children. These charts, um, they just continue to uh, emphasize the fact that you know this, this, these, these kids and this generation that has earned the title of Generation Rx is something um, that, that is unprecedented. Um, and it really begs the question, why? You know, why have we seen these jaw-dropping increases in the rates of allergies? Why from 1997 till 2002 was there a doubling of the peanut allergy? Why has there been this dramatic increase in hospitalizations of children with food allergic reactions? Why are we seeing so many kids with autism today? These conditions were rare when we were children. We didn't have to worry about a PB&J and a carton of milk on a lunchroom table when we were kids, but today, Today we do. And so as you really stop and you really say, okay, let's just look at the data because the numbers tell their own story. Let's look at the data. In the last 20 years, there's been a 400% increase in the rate of food allergies in kids, a 300% increase in the rate of asthma, 56% increase in the rate of asthma-related deaths, 400% increase in the, in the rates of ADHD, and the corresponding statistics that go with this data for anybody that gets that pushback, which is far too common, which is we're counting this more, you know, we, the doctors are diagnosing it more. We're also seeing a correlating increase in the rates of medications that are being prescribed to this, these kids. So whether it's an increase in the rates of EpiPen sales, which, you know, year over year can increase something like 76 percent, or if it's an increase in, in the rates of ADHD medication. I mean, the U.S. only accounts for 5% of the world's population, but we account for somewhere between 80 and 90% of the prescriptions for ADHD medications. And as a result, we know that our kids have earned this title of Generation Rx. I think when you really stop and look at the food allergy space, it is very telling. It just begs the question, are our children allergic to food or are they allergic to what has been done to it? In a 10-year period, the CDC reported a 265% increase in the rate of hospitalizations related to food allergic reactions. That is in a 10-year period, and that is people checking into the ER. That's not somebody saying that their kid has a food allergy or that there's a food sensitivity. Those are ER doctors checking people into the hospital because of the seriousness of this condition today. And I think as you really step back and you sort of say, okay, so what have we done to our food? And what exactly is a food allergy? Because in all candor, it was our fourth child that woke me up to this epidemic. And up until that point, I really didn't know. And a food allergy is when your body sees food proteins as foreign. And so that your body, to defend itself, just launches this inflammatory response to drive out those foreign invaders. And in some cases, it can be mild, kind of runny nose, watery eyes, mucousy, itchy skin. Or in some cases, it can be this severe, life-threatening, allergic reaction. And as you really step into that and you say, OK, so our bodies are seeing these proteins as foreign invaders. Are there new proteins in our food today that were not there when we were kids? And when I asked that question seven years ago, nothing could have prepared me for the answer. But yes, there are new proteins in our food today that did not exist 15 years ago. And these new proteins, as they were introduced into the food supply around the world, 91 countries around the world said we're either going to limit these new proteins into the food supply or we're going to label them so that people can make an informed choice. Here in the U.S., these proteins started getting pumped into our food supply, really flooded into our food supply in the late 1990s and early 2000s to the point today where 70 to 80 percent of processed foods on American shelves contain these new genetically engineered proteins, but we haven't been told. There were no labels. It wasn't the only thing that I learned as I came into this space. You know, as I was studying the statistics with the number of children that are allergic today to all of these different foods, I was also realizing that we have 
absolutely hopped up our food supply on ingredients that other countries have either banned or never allowed in the first place. This list is an example of some of those ingredients. And, you know, as Andrea mentioned, so many of these ingredients are found in so many processed foods. As I came through that, I thought, you know, here we have this label USDA organic, whereas the rest of the world just, they just call it food. And they label the genetically engineered ingredients and they label these other ingredients. But here in the US, we kind of flip the system and we put the burden of the responsibility on the organic food producers and they're charged a whole bunch more to prove that their products are safe when really the ownership should be on the companies that are polluting the food supply with all of these artificial ingredients and with all of these additives. And as I came through that, you know, this is where the issue became much bigger than, than me, much bigger than food allergies, much bigger than, than, than children. I truly believe that the right to clean and safe food is a fundamental human right that should be afforded to all Americans. And I think that the only way that we can have access to that is with complete information so that we have the knowledge that we need to protect the health of our families. We label fat, we label protein, we label allergens, we label if orange juice comes from concentrate and whether milk is pasteurized. And yet we have introduced this new technology that has two characteristics. One is to produce its own insecticide. The other is so that our food crops can be routinely sprayed with weed killer. And yet we have not labeled that new process and those new proteins in our food. And I think that it gives us this opportunity as parents to really inspire and create that change around the country so that we can join the rest of the world and we can have access to that same right to protect our children here in the United States that has been given to mothers and families around the world. Andrea is a registered holistic nutritionist, co-founder of The Healthy Shopper, Inc., and Naturally Savvy Media, and author of Unjunk Your Junk Food. She's an expert label reader and has made it her mission to help others make healthier choices by teaching them how to properly read labels so they can understand what they are putting into and on their bodies. Andrea appears regularly at Healthy Living Expert on news segments across North America, and she has also been featured in a variety of magazines and newspapers such as Health, Shape, Newsday, Women's Day, Men's Fitness, the Chicago Tribune, and Los Angeles Times. Andrea, we really appreciate you joining us today. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Carly. Hi, everyone. I don't think it would surprise any of you if I told you that when looking for a snack, choosing a fruit or vegetable, over a candy bar would be the better option. But what might surprise you, those times when we do choose the candy bar, is that we can make better choices because there are healthier alternatives to the junk food we crave. So what makes for a bad food choice? Most of us would think of foods high in fat and calories. However, my definition of a bad food choice are foods laden with chemical additives. The reality is we live in a world where convenience is the norm. We rush to work to make a living for our families, then we rush to take our kids to dance or soccer practice. I'm no different. Because of our fast-paced life, we buy ready-made or packaged foods that make our day that much easier. So I believe healthy living starts by reading labels. For those times we can't make our own homemade food and we need the extra help, learning the basics of reading food labels is the key to improving our overall health and preventing obesity and associated diseases like heart disease and diabetes. As a society, we've been conditioned to examine the fat and calorie content of the products we're buying. But we need to change our old habits and start to look at food labels in a new way. We need to shift our thinking. It's important to read ingredients first and then the Nutrition Facts panel. Because if a product contains harmful ingredients, it doesn't matter how many calories or how much fat it has, we shouldn't be eating it anyways. The image on the right is an example of a product that contains clean organic ingredients. We would say that it is naturally savvy approved. My friends gave me the nickname Inspector Label many years ago because I love to read every single label of every single product I put into my grocery cart. So today I'm hoping I can inspire you to refrain your thinking so that you can become your own Inspector Label when shopping for groceries. And I'm going to show you how. Over the course of the two years it took my co-authors and I to write on Junk or Junk Food, we noticed certain ingredients kept appearing over and over again in the foods we identified as a bad choice. After sampling hundreds of products, we noticed that these same bad choice ingredients were found not only in junk food, but in many of the packaged foods as well. 
Using research as a foundation for our book, we identified a group of seven harmful chemical additives that are proven to cause harm to our body. We call these the scary seven. They are high fructose corn syrup, trans fats, monosodium glutamate or MSG, artificial colors, artificial flavors, artificial sweeteners, and certain preservatives. You can see they're all listed here on the chart. Now I'm going to take you through each of the scary seven ingredients and explain why we need to avoid them whenever possible. High fructose corn syrup is the first of the scary seven ingredients. It's an inexpensive type of sugar, but it comes at a high cost to our health. The reason this sugar is harmful is because it's highly processed and is metabolized differently than any other sugar. The fructose in high fructose corn syrup goes straight to our liver, where it's converted to fat and it gets recirculated into our bloodstream, resulting in high triglyceride levels, which is, which is a risk factor for heart disease. Research shows high fructose corn syrup can lead to heart disease, increased belly fat, insulin resistance, which is the step just before type 2 diabetes, obesity, and last year a study out of UCLA showed that consuming a diet high in high fructose corn syrup slows the brain, causing memory loss and delayed learning. To the right of this page, you'll see an example of how you would spot high fructose corn syrup written on a food label. You can see in two places. The second ingredient on our scary seven list is trans fats. Trans fats are used for consistency and to prolong the shelf life of a product. That way you can go back to a store a year later and still see that same can of soup sitting on that same shelf. So why are they so bad? Experts agree that there is no safe limit of ingesting trans fats because research has proven they lead to cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. Many food manufacturers are moving away from using trans fats, but unfortunately, not enough. You can identify if a product contains trans fats if its ingredients contain any of the following. Partially hydrogenated oils, hydrogenated oils, shortening, datum, and mono and diglycerides. So you're at the grocery store and find a product that has zero trans fats listed on the nutrition facts panel. Great, right? Well, not really, because zero doesn't necessarily mean zero. There's a label loophole that allows companies to write zero trans fats on the nutrition facts panel if there's less than 0.5 grams of trans fats per serving, per serving. Most of us eat more than one serving in one sitting, let alone over the course of the year. This is the Nutrition Facts panel of that same product we just saw on the previous slide that was, had three different highlighted trans fats on the ingredient list. This product is an example of why it's so important to read those ingredients carefully. If we just looked at the Nutrition Facts panel, we would have thought that this product is safe to eat because it lists zero trans fats. But reading the ingredients shows us a different story, as you could see from this picture right here. One, two, three. ingredient to appear on our scary seven list is artificial sweeteners. Many of us use them in place of sugar to lower our caloric intake. Artificial sweeteners are 200 to 600,000 times sweeter than sugar. They're addictive and are used in thousands of products. They've been linked to side effects including headaches, dizziness, and anxiety to name a few. I interviewed a woman who went temporarily blind from all the aspartame she was drinking in her diet soda. The good news is that once she stopped drinking it, her eyesight came back. Most of the research conducted on artificial sweeteners is outdated. However, animal studies show that they can cause cancer in animals. It's important to mention that aspartame converts to formaldehyde before it exits the body, which is a known carcinogen. Newer research is showing that they're linked to obesity and a decrease of good bacteria in our gut, which is significant because our immune systems depend on good bacteria to keep us healthy. Artificial colors are the fourth of the scary seven ingredients. Companies add bright colors to our food because if it looks good, we think it must taste good. We eat with our eyes. The use of artificial food dyes has increased 50% since 1990s, and these bright colors are found in everything from food to pharmaceutical drugs to cosmetics. Stable and cheaper than natural colors that come from fruits and vegetables. Research shows that artificial dyes can lead to allergies and nasal congestion. But perhaps the most bothersome for me as a mom of three is that I, they cause hyperactivity in children with and without behavior issues, and they exhibit symptoms of children with ADD, ADHD. 
In our house, I could tell within 10 minutes if one of my kids has ingested chemical food dyes because how it negatively affects their behavior. We call it the crazies. The fifth scary seven ingredient is monosodium glutamate. MSG is a flavor enhancer used to make our food taste better. Research shows it's addictive, which can cause us to eat more. How often are we able to sit down with a bowl of chips and dip and stop at just one? I know I can. <laughs> Side effects of MSG include headaches, chest pains, heart MSG is well known for its presence in Chinese food, but it's found in thousands of products including dressings, chips, soup, sauces, and flavored rice. Artificial flavors is number six of the scary seven removes much of the flavor. One artificial flavor can be made up of anywhere from one to hundreds of different man-made chemicals. For example, the typical butter flavor found on our microwave popcorn is made up of over 100 man-made chemicals, mostly from petrochemical ingredients. Reported side effects of artificial flavors include, include behavior and allergic reactions. So the scary seven ingredients are grouped as preservatives. Preservatives are used to slow rancidity, prevent oxidation, and prolong the shelf life of a product. The preservatives, were found, preservatives we found to cause the most harm were TBHQ, which you could find in frozen fish and some chocolates, any of the polysorbates, 60, 65, and 80, which are very common in frozen foods, nitrates found in cured meats, such as hot dogs, sausages, bacon, and lunch meats, sulfites, which you can find in dried fruits, balsamic vinegar, and red wine, sodium benzoate found in acidic foods and drinks, BHA, BHT, very common in cereal, chewing gum, and baked goods, and potassium sorbate, found in dairy products and baked goods as well. Each of these preservatives comes with its own list of side effects, including but not limited to cancer, liver and kidney damage, allergic reactions, infertility, and tinnitus. The good news is that there are healthier options for our favorite packaged foods that don't contain harmful additives. There are several, and they all taste great. You can find many of them in our books, in our books Unjunk Junk Food and Label Lessons, Your Guide to a Free Grocery Cart, which is a free ebook. You can also find healthy alternatives on our website at naturallysavvy.com. We are continuously vetting out products and companies for healthier options, and to be honest with you, that's my personal passion. So I'm going to leave you with this. You don't have to give up the foods you love, just give up the toxic ingredients. At Naturally Savvy, we like to say to take the junk out of our junk food. It may take time to acclimate your taste buds to chemical-free eating, but as you start to wean yourself off harmful additives, you'll notice that the food tastes better using non-chemical ingredients. I'm going to kick off the Q&A session. First question is for Dr. Green. Um, when do you recommend I start feeding my big solid food? Four months or six months? And what's easy on their tummy? So my take on that's a little different than most people. <clears throat> For kids who are getting breast milk, they're already getting the perfect food. And they're getting flavors that change meal to meal based on what moms are eating. We've, studies have shown that kids can learn to like a vegetable just from tasting it in breast milk. Uh, the first study on that was done with carrots. So for breastfed kids, there's really no rush. I suggest waiting until kids are demanding it. And for most kids, that's about six months old. For kids who are getting mostly formula, though, even if the formulas, even though the formulas today are better than any in history, they're basically simple processed foods with one flavor again and again and again. They don't have all the complex nutrients that are real foods. So for them, I would suggest starting when they get interested in it and are able to sit up with support. And usually, that's about four months old. But I would look more at the child than look at the calendar. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, Robin, second question is for you. Aren't there good things about GMOs if, for example, crops are modified so you don't need pesticides anymore? You know, this is a great question. And I, before I had these four kids, um, I was a financial analyst that covered the food industry. So I was used to these claims that these companies would put forward to promote um, market acceptance of their products. And I think um, that's exactly what happened when this new technology was introduced, when these new proteins were introduced. The promise to shareholders in these financial statements was that it was going to reduce the use of these weed killers and these toxic chemicals being poured on our crops. Um, what we have actually learned is that the exact opposite has proven true. 
and that we've seen over a 500 million pound increase in the amounts of weed killers being poured on these crops as they resist this new technology. And it is creating all kinds of problems for farmers. Tractors are, are having to, to, I mean, it is, it is really creating all kinds of problems. I mean, tractor tires are getting destroyed by the strength of these. They're having to go to these industrial strength tractors. They're having to, you know, use different um, techniques in, in, in treating the crops or having to go to more powerful, more toxic chemicals in order to treat the crops. And so I think, again, it's why the, the conversation is so important because while it may very well have been well intended when it was first introduced 15 or 20 years ago with these promises that it was going to reduce the use of a lot of these chemicals, what we're finding is that the exact opposite is proving out in the marketplace, which is, I think, why today we really are starting to have this awakening around it and people are starting to really ask these very important questions that probably should have been asked 15 years ago. And again, you know, when you say GMOs, it's really important to recognize that these are a whole bunch of different technologies. On the one hand, some are designed to withstand increasing doses of chemicals. On the other, some are designed to create their own insecticidal proteins within the crop. That fundamental change was so different in our corn in the United States that our corn is now regulated by the EPA as a pesticide because of its ability to produce its own insecticide. And so all of these different GMOs are different technologies. And again, it speaks to why it is so important that they be labeled because just as we have all kinds of different technologies in a computer, you want to know what parts work and what parts don't. Thank you, Robin. Very insightful. I'm getting uh, messages here saying that, that that was extremely helpful. So, Andrea, next question is for you. Uh, one, are hot dogs and bacon considered okay if they are from 100% pastured raised animals, uncured and nitrate and preservative free? Well, I would say that um, as a rule, anything would, be, would have to be eaten in moderation. So I'm not a big fan of those foods in general, but having kids, uh, we do buy them. And if you are going to buy hot dogs specifically, because my kids love to eat them, or lunch meats, I am going to look for the ones that are organic, like you mentioned in the question. So I would say yes, they are the better option. But something to, to note is that even in the natural um, hot dogs, or you'll see natural lunch meats in the stores, some of them contain cultured celery salt, which is Form, which do contain nitrates, they're just naturally occurring nitrates. So, you know, as a general rule, I'd say really limit these types of foods, especially when it comes to our kids. And now that it's summer and barbecue season, I know that it's probably being eaten a little bit more than normal, but I'd say, you know, I would say definitely limit the, the consumption of it and try to avoid it if you can, but if you are going to buy these types of foods, then definitely choose the organic, pasture-raised, preservative-free and nitrate-free options. And you could tell if a product has is preservative-free or nitrate-free, it'll say it on the front of the package. So definitely look to see that it says nitrate-free. Thank you, Andrea. It looks like we have room for one more round of questions. So Dr. Green, I'll start with you. I see you've been answering many of these questions over the chat, but um, one of the ones we caught earlier on was, uh, I recommend goat's milk to women who cannot breastfeed. How do you feel about this? So as we talked about, just the right proteins and fat combination is packed with immune benefits. It's, it's got different flavors every time you feed. There's really nothing like it. The idea behind formula is to try to take an existing milk and manipulate the levels of fat and protein and vitamins and minerals to try to at least kind of come close to breast milk. And, and, I, and I think that's a good idea for, for if women can't breastfeed or if there's not milk, a banked breast milk available. Um, I think goat's milk would be a fantastic choice as the basis for a formula. The proteins tend to be less allergenic. The, the fat profile is better. It's easier to digest. There's a couple of problems with it in respect to breast milk. The one is it's pretty low in folate, which is really important for the developing baby, and vitamin B12. So if someone does choose to use goat's milk, I would be sure they're getting other sources of that. Thank you, Dr. Green. Uh, Robin, I think this, this is a very important question. Uh, are there any national campaigns or legislation you recommend we join influence that will help mandate companies label their foods appropriately? No, that is a great question. And this is where I think um, the power of moms collectively as we navigate the grocery store aisles and as we lend our voices to issues online um, cannot be underestimated. 
I serve on the board of Just Label It, which is a national organization, which is really saying, hey, FDA, isn't it your job to kind of look into this and require that these genetically engineered ingredients be labeled? Because the, the system they're using is 20 years old, and it's based on data and information before these, these products were really in the marketplace. And today, in light of the escalating rates of diseases, you know, a lot of people are starting to say, hey, shouldn't we be doing a rethink of this? So that's a great organization nationally. But I also really invite you to get involved locally and at the state level because what we're seeing after California where they tried to pass legislation to have genetically engineered ingredients labeled in their food, um, the, the industry that we're up against you know, threw $46 million against those efforts and what was remarkable is that it woke a lot of people up and you suddenly realize that you know, there, there really is a consumer basic right to know and it's that's a fundamental freedom, in my opinion, if you're trying to protect the health of your children, that you have access to information in your food. And already in 2013, uh, 26 states around the country are working on legislation that would require the labeling of genetically engineered ingredients. And so while a state-by-state -state kind of patchwork approach um, probably is not going to be what we end up with in the long run, it sends a very powerful message to the CEOs of Safeway and Target and Chipotle and all these companies that are starting to introduce products that don't have genetically engineered ingredients in them, that, hey, we're paying attention, and we really appreciate it when you guys opt out. That's great. Amazing work. And we're so here to here today as well. Uh, Andrea, last question for you. Um, first off, I, I know there's a lot of parents on this call who are interested in hearing about some of the products you recommend. Um, and then after you name a few, if you can share some more information about your free eBooks so that people can download that as well. Sure. Um, Carly, were there any specific products that they're looking for, or is it more just in general company brand names that I trust? Yeah, I would talk about company brand names you trust. It was a, it was a very general question that came in. Okay. Excuse me. Sure. So, I mean, there are some great companies out there that are doing fantastic work. Um, and many of these companies I've been working with for many, many years. So for example, I'm gluten intolerant. So some of the companies that I believe that are doing amazing work on the gluten-free front would be Pamela's products. Um, their products are also GMO free. They're not certified GMO, but they are in the process of getting it GMO free, uh, becoming GMO free. I also think that Udi's is a great product and I'm also a big fan of Rudy's. Rudy's makes a great gluten-free bread. And other companies like Nature's Path Foods and Annie's Organics, these are all companies that are really late July that are making some really terrific products that don't contain any of these harmful ingredients. A lot of the companies are on our website. So you can go to naturallysavvy.com. You'll see we work with a lot of these companies. And it would be great, Carly, I could provide you with a list of some of, the, some of my favorite brands that I you know, purchase myself on a regular basis, especially when it comes to snacks for my kids. So, and, and there's, there's the usual go-tos. So, and there's, also, there's always new companies that are coming out. And now with all, you know, all these GMO-free labeling, like Rob, you know, Robin's so passionate about and talks a lot about, I think it's important, too, for parents not to be confused by the labeling, going back to what I was talking about for some of these GMO-free products that are on the shelf. So, for example, I took my son shopping not too long ago, and I teach them how to read labels, and he was looking for a snack for school, and he found this product, and he said, here, Mom, look at this. It's a GMO-free product, because on the front of the product, it said GMO all cross, you know, a big kind of cross between it, and it said no trans fats, no MSG. So I say, oh, give me the product. Let me take a look. And the ingredients listed were GMO-free, you know, sweet potatoes and GMO-free grains, but if you look closer, it had canola oil and sugar. So these companies are misleading consumers. So that's why it's such a great question is that you know, we need to vet these companies, and that's what I do love to do. So if there are any specific companies that any of you are interested in and learn, you know, want to learn more about, I'm happy to answer those questions. You can ask it on Facebook or on Twitter. I'm happy to answer it. And then you can also find a lot, of those, a lot more of those on our website. Um, in terms of label lessons, um, you know, it's our free ebook. I'm going to type the URL into this chat, into the chat so you guys can access it for free there. Um, we've written two books called Label Lessons. The first one was to unjunk your, your grocery cart and basically uh, teaches you how to shop and what to look for, very similar to unjunk your junk food. And our second one, which is coming out August 12th, we've teamed up with Healthy Child, Healthy World to donate up to $10,000 to them. So for every time that you share our Label Lessons Unjunk Your Kids Lunchbox book, we're going to donate a dollar to Healthy Child, Healthy World. So we're very, very excited about 
spreading this information. And we do recommend some great brands in there like Math Organic, Orange Juice and Apple Juice, Rudy's Breads, Barbara's Organic Cereals, and, and many more. Thank you, Andrew. Very excited to see that new ebook. Uh, well, that will close our Q&A session today. I would like to thank you again to all of you for joining us today and for being patient through our technical difficulties. Uh, we will be giving away prizes to random attendees post-webinar, so keep your eyes peeled for an email if you've been selected. To reiterate, I've seen a lot of questions come through in the chat portal. This recorded presentation will be available online tomorrow by visiting our online Easy Steps Resource Center at healthychild.org slash resource dash center. You'll be able to access the PDF of the presentation and the actual recorded webinar. A very special thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, wonderful people doing great work, Dr. Alan Green, Robin O'Brien, and Andrea Donsky. Uh, you can find their contact information on the slide that's currently posted. And it will also be in the PDF presentation. Um, also, we would like to thank our sponsors of the Safer Foods Resource Center, Clover Organic and Sage Spoonfuls. To learn more, you can visit www.cloverstornetta.com or www.sagespoonfuls.com. Thank you so much and enjoy your day. <laughs>